Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? So that's a loaded question. Isn't it? How are you today? <laughs> if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, and uh, in chapters one and two, we're going to do a little bit of a review here today. Can somebody just give me some highlights of uh, chapters one and chapters two of the book of Luke? What was going on? John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was born. He was six months older than Jesus. And Elizabeth and, uh, and Zechariah, the priest. The miracle of God in their later later years. Anybody else? Carol, yeah. you can just shout. Hey, hey, <laughs> how are you? Doing? Luke is writing a detailed account. He wanted to do the research and make sure it was accurate and you know, put out there yeah. as the accurate truth. Right. He was concerned about history. Yeah. Like putting Jesus in history. Uh, and we see that today is very important yeah. because a lot of people, you know, dismiss Jesus, you know, altogether. Uh, anyone else? Story about Zacharias and him not being able to speak again. Yeah. It's the miracle of God worked in his life to proclaim the birth <laughs> of his son. Right, right. And how about uh, how about Jesus when he was what twelve years old? They go, mm -hmm. you know, they go and. And then they turn around, they're going home, and they can't find him, and he's, he's a, wouldn't that, it's apparent, I was, I, I'm just thinking, like, it's apparent, wouldn't that make kind of upset you just a little bit, yeah. you know, I was thinking, like, if my kid stayed back, you know, and hung back and didn't tell me, I don't know, I, I, <laughs> I might not have been so kind, <laughs> but he was uh, 12 years old there, and he's in there, and he's talking to uh, the teachers and asking questions and all these things and then at the end of chapter 12 jesus is 12 years old right and so john would have been about 12 years old too and then how long is it be before then that you actually hear about jesus again how many years pass about 18 years so jesus goes to a little town called what? Nazareth. He goes to Nazareth, doesn't he? And he is, the Bible says, I think it's in 176 or 150, he, he remains in subjection to his parents. So he's, for 18 years, he's just being a good kid and learning and, you know, being good to his parents. And, and then John the Baptist, now what happens to him? He goes out in the wilderness. He goes out in the wilderness, doesn't he? Yeah. So Jesus goes to Nazareth. John goes to the wilderness up until they're what? About age 30. Right. So, you know, and we talk about John and uh, I think we shared this last week that uh, he was actually of the priestly lineage of Zacharias. So he, he would have fallen into his father's quote trade. He would have become a priest. And at age 20, uh, actually, I saw some commentaries at age 20, you actually go into the priesthood, but, but I found something else that was, I thought was really cool this week, that yes, they do, but they don't start to actually do priestly things until they're 30. So there's a 10-year uh, span of training and learning that they go through, and I thought that was really interesting. There's Jesus in seclusion in Nazareth. He is in training, if you will. And there's John <coughs> at age 20 to age 30. He is in training, right? Yeah. And instead of John going into the priesthood at 20 and taking 10 years to uh, get to the point where he could actually become an active priest, he goes into the wilderness. And who teaches him in the wilderness? The Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. 
So he's going through training, but it's a little bit, a little bit different than, than what he uh, would have. So um, let's read this here in chapter three, verse one, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Licinius, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he went out into the region and around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sin. So we found, here he is right there. Remember this guy? Anybody tell me something about Tiberius? What did you learn anything last week about Tiberius? Second emperor, right? Yeah. Followed Augustus Caesar. Actually had a co-regency with him for a couple of years. That was probably some of the problems that they had uh, of gaining, actually, uh, his reign. Remember here, this is the Roman Empire. This is what they covered, which was pretty much pretty much everything, if you think about it. Pretty much world domination. Pontius Pilate. Tell me something about Pontius Pilate. Anybody? Give you a little more information. How about that? Where was Pontius Pilate governor of? You remember? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This little spot right down here. Yeah. Okay. So Tiberius, all that. Pontius Pilate, just a little bitty thing there. Fifth governor of Rome. And uh, Roman governor. We talked about that a little bit. Tetrarchs. Everybody remember about the Tetrarchs? Who were the Tetrarchs? Philip? Remember Philip? And Herod Antipas, and then there was Archelaus, where we talked about him, he got kicked out because he was being overly cruel. We thought that was kind of funny, wasn't it? There's the uh, Herodian Tetrarchy, we talked about that. Da -da -da. Antipas, Philip, who was probably the best of the Herods, he was probably the nicest guy, did the most good for people. Lysidius, remember we didn't hear much about him. That little place called Abilene, which is just a really little small place. See right there, <laughs> right there, that little red spot, just a little spot. Oh, how about these guys? Annas and Caiaphas. Okay, what happened to Annas? Do you remember? Annas got to deposed by the Romans. Or something, I'm not exactly sure this isn't exact with that. But he gets deposed by the Romans. But what did the Jews think about that? Once a king, once a king. Yeah, once a, once a high priest, yeah. always a high priest, right? For your life. So they weren't really happy about that at all. But the Romans put in who? Caiaphas. Okay, so Caiaphas is there. And so in the scriptures, you see kind of a co-priesthood there for a while. And like and it's is really the, you know, he's always he's mentioned first here because mm -hmm. for a reason. He's the know. he's the gun. He's, he's the big gun. He's, he's the main, he's the main uh, the main person behind the scene. Right. He is. Yeah. <laughs> he <laughs> looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not much better. He ain't got that sinister look, does he? <laughs> That's his son in law, too. So, yeah, you know, like keep it in the family. Keep it in the family. Yeah. Yeah. He had clear skin. <laughs> <laughs> so, now we got a geographical setting here, and now we're talking about John the Baptist. Tell me some things about John the Baptist. Original, free spirited. Just, just does what the Holy Spirit tells him to do. He's not in for politics or. But he was really into fashion, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he was a Camel fashion skin. guy. What did he wear? Camel, Camel skin or something like leather, that. Leather belt. And uh, we know he didn't have a problem with weight because what did he eat? 
Uh, Locus is honey. Let's imagine that. Um, how many years in the desert? We don't know exactly. Ten more, maybe. That's all we need. Yeah. And how, how do I get upset at night when I go to bed and I can't find something to eat? <laughs> they got a whole drawer full of chips and ice cream and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, here this poor guy, he's eating locusts and uh, honey. But you know what? What did Jesus say about John the Baptist? There was no greater prophet. No greater man. So let's all go get some camel hair and some locusts and some honey. And <laughs> let's see how that works. So here's where John was. He was in this wilderness area right there. And uh, for a long time, and it looked kind of like that, remember? It wasn't like a desert. I mean, it wasn't like a forest. It was it was full-blown, full-blown desert, okay? Very, Betzel says it's difficult to describe adequately for boning desolation. A howling barren is along the shores of the Dead Sea. If there can be fixed in one's mind the image of an almost painful sterility of the Sahara or of Death Valley, then multiply that factor of four or more, what might come close to capturing the geographical reality in which he was exposed along the shores of the Dead Sea. Uh -huh. So, not a great place, no. but I would want it for sure. So. Then Luke 3, 2 and 3 says, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness, and he went into the region around Jordan. The word there was a rhema word, not a logos word, not a written word, so he didn't get it out of the scriptures. But it came somehow, okay, and it came just the same way as it came to Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, um, Joel, Jonah, Micah, Zephaniah, Haggai, okay, the word of the Lord came, and he thoughts about it. how does that happen? How does the word of the Lord come to these prophets? He guesses. I think it would be through their heart, just like it is today, pretty much. I don't think it was an honorable voice necessarily. But that would have been cool. Yeah. Wouldn't. Then you don't know for sure, would you? Speak like oh. that at times. Yeah. To the prophet. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. And there it was. There he is, hanging out. Now, when we think about our feet kicked up in the sand, where do we want to be? Along the we want to be at the beach, no? Yeah, but not John. He's he's down there in the desert, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Here he is, baptizing in all the region. And we showed where he was baptizing most of the time. And this right here is where he baptized mostly down here. And uh, interesting, I, I read something this week about why he. Kind of stayed down here a lot, and uh, I'm going to go back to figure that out just to make sure this is true. But that's where Joshua brought the people into the promised land, right there. So I thought that's cool, that's pretty cool. So, today, three important theological realities characterized John's preaching. First one, one look at is the hope of forgiveness of sin. Says here, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Let's review. How was the situation that the Jews were in at this time? Yeah, pretty much fallen away from from the traditions of faith and trusting in God, and they become very carnal at the moment and very disenchanted with with God. They haven't heard anything for four hundred years. Right? You no, know, there had been no prophet outside mm -hmm. of John. And, right. And so things were pretty dry and brittle at the moment. Well, one day at that time, I mean, he's having, they're baptized for the forgiveness, but at that time, it was all the sacrifices, right? They would go to the temple and they'd make, yes. yeah, it was supposed to get rid of their sin. This is a right. completely different situation. Completely different. Well, you know, one of the things I think of when we talk about that word, Rima, 
See, sometimes I think we paint John as being this rogue hippie guy living in Eden, wandering around the desert and having his guitar he strums on. But those words that are written there, song, <coughs> was written long, long, long before. Mm -hmm. And two people looked at those. One people were the Pharisees, who had no clue as to what that meant. Just as you were saying, they lived in a desert, in a dry land. And isn't it funny? That's where he was baptizing people, where there was no water. So there must have been something else. Rima, when I think of that word and I think of the scripture and the word came upon the word of God, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So that word, I think, was given to him as an understanding. He was a prophet. He was saying this was going to happen and he pointed to the word to show what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So we can never discount, I think, the Torah. Okay, and, and that, that I, I just want to Mm -hmm. I, sure. In my mind, I, I'm not dogmatic about it, but I couldn't believe that somebody who just came up to me and said, this is going to happen. Because we find that in our society today all the time. Right? Right. And I, I just don't believe that. But I mm -hmm. will believe it if you show me in scripture. Yeah. You could turn problem. to the religious system because they were all corrupt and man is bizarre and out mm -hmm. for money. And, you know, so who would you turn to? Right. Well, that's where I was going. When, when, when the Jews are in this situation in, in chapter three, and then politically, what's the situation? They're governed by Rome, uh -huh. aren't they? They're, you know, it's not, they, I think, I think they had lost their, you know, like, like you see when the prophets come, like when the prophets come, it's, it's bad news. Yeah. You know, it, it's always bad news. Like, okay. You did this, now you're going into captivity, okay? Would you say that they were already in captivity yeah. at some point? Sure. I mean, they've lost, they've lost their land. They've lost their freedom. They're taxed beyond belief. The Romans are doing to them whatever they want to do. You know, if they want your kid, they take your kid. If they want your daughter, they take their... I mean, so they were kind of in captivity, at least in my mind, you know, right where they're, they're already at. Okay, so that's point one. Point two is religiously, how are they? You know, they're dead. They're, they're, yeah, yeah, they have a they have a corrupt uh, religious system. You know, <laughs> you're you're looking at the bad the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You're looking at Annas, you're looking at Caiaphas. Those are the only people that are doing well. If you could even say they're doing well, everybody else is not doing well. Okay, and. At this point, you know, when, when you're talking about the religious system of the day, um, what is it that if, if you would say, um, I am going to be saved or, or I am saved or, or I am uh, right with God, how does that happen in this system? Well, you have to be approved by the religious system. and They could actually kick you out of church if you want to. If you didn't do according to what they wanted to be done, then, then basically you were condemned to hell. Right. Um, we well, you know, Dave, I think another way is, is what they had mostly lost was their belief. And their belief now was in men and the men and the rules that they set down. The Ten Commandments that God gave them now turned into 3,200 yeah. men's rules. Right. And so you say, I did come to salvation. You yeah. can't prove salvation through the word of God. Yeah, but but for them, it was works, wasn't it? It was focusing on external behavior instead of heart attitudes. It was making showy public displays, is what this says here, um, of what? Giving to the poor, okay? Of praying, tithing. of tithing, of fasting. Do you remember the stories, you know, the... The guy's out there and and like he's he's showing that he's doing good, he's praying prayers, you know, and they're doing all these things for what? For show. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where this is basically come to is it's not hard attitude, it's more. It's like, how do you earn? And agreeing with and agreeing with the leader. And agreeing with the leader. The podium, or you're right. Leader. Yeah. Or you're you're just in serious trouble. So I think at this particular time. It wasn't the people that had a, had a desire to run off on idols 
or run off, you know, uh, following after other gods. I think they were they were truly at a point where you know they were pretty low, mm -hmm. and I think the hope that they had was like John said, it was in the scriptures. Right. They had they had a hope, and it was it was in what they remember because you know you know for, for a lot of us uh, a lot of people say quote in the Christian world today they really don't study the Bible real well you know what I mean these people they knew the word <laughs> you know they memorized the Old Testament I mean these these were not slouches by any means they knew the word and they knew what what this said but does not give a different framing of that word Rima. Yeah, they didn't know, but John did know. But John did know, yeah. So definition of hope uh, that I believe they had. A desire accompanied by expectation of or belief in fulfillment. Okay, this is what they had. They didn't have much, but they did have hope. And they did know the scriptures. And I believe, too, that not only was, was that a factor in that, but do you think that maybe that God was doing something in their hearts at this time? You know, some commentators, um, they, they talk about a messianic fervor that, you know, what, what does the Bible say? When the time was right, Jesus came. And I think there was a, somewhat of a preparation even in their hearts to be ready for, for this particular event. Jeremiah says, uh, they will not teach again, each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember them no more. Micah, he will again have compassion on us, he will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So they knew about God's grace. They knew about God's Forgiveness. I think grace is mentioned more times than mercy is mentioned more times in the Old Testament. Okay. Let's read some Old Testament passages that's going to reinforce our thoughts about uh, what they knew. Can somebody look those up? Just, we'll just run down for them. When, when you hit your, when you hit your verse, just share it. So let's start with Jeremiah 33, 8 through 9. Uh, and, it shall, and it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth. And it shall hear of all the good that I. I do unto them that they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. Okay, next. Yes. No, let me get back at eight. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned, their iniquity where they, where they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquity whereby they have sinned. Eight. <laughs> And whereby they have transgressed against me. Huh? I, I, read the, I read nine first and then I had to go back there. <laughs> it's okay. He says forgive. I did reverse. How about Jeremiah 50? Check. But I will bring back Israel to its home, and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan. His soul shall be satisfied on Mount Ephraim and Gilead. In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought, but there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, but they shall not be found. For I will pardon those whom I preserve. That's good news. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah. Remain that way continually. Is that the one we went right in the chapter? Nine. Nine, right? No. Nine. 16 through Nine. 17. 16 and 17. 16 and 17. Yeah. Okay. 
Sure. It remained that way continually. The cloud would cover the tabernacle by day, and by night it would appear like fire. Whenever the cloud was lifted from above the tent, is that right? Huh? Oh, I'm in numbers. That's why. I'm <laughs> 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 oh, sorry. Technical glitch there, guys. <laughs> oh, love it. Just a little technical glitch. Let's, let's get it back to where it was. I like that verse, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's good. So he thought he was bad reading the wrong. <laughs> Somebody stole me and Maya. Okay, while well, John's trying to find me, <laughs> everybody else <laughs> find one of those other ones. <laughs> we can maybe have a little snack or something while we're waiting for John to catch up. Yeah. Five, one, three, three. Yeah. She has All right. She has Praises be to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. I have. One of three. Okay. Um, let's see. And the Lord is compassionate and gracious, mm -hmm. slow to anger and abounding in love. That's good. Oh, I got to keep going. Keep going. <laughs> what book of, um, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, mm -hmm. so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. You, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Oh, my turn. Okay. <laughs> Nehemiah 9. <laughs> okay, 16 and 17. Uh, but they and our fathers became arrogant and stiff-necked, and they did not obey your commandments. They refused to listen and failed to remember. Failed to remember, right. If they knew those passages. They knew hope. They knew about forgiveness. They knew about grace. Number <coughs> two, the need for repentance. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions so that iniquity may not be a stumbling block to you. Cast away from all your transgressions which you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. That's good news, too, isn't it? Yes. Isaiah says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct, declares the Lord. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions, so that iniquity not be, may not become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in it. The death of anyone who dies declares the Lord, therefore repent and live. Now, something about forgiveness. I think we have a problem with this today in our country when you talk about um, salvation. Yep. You know, how how do you get saved? What 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 actually happens, you know? There is <laughs> uh, forgiveness that comes. And John, do you happen to have that quote that you shared last week, could you I, share that I again? I was just looking at it again. Good. Good. Could you share that? Uh, repentance has two sides. Turning away from sin and turning toward God. Mm -hmm. It is truly repentance. To be truly repentant, you must do both. Right. You mm -hmm. can't just say, we, we, we say believe and live however you want to. Right. And I think that's a problem that 
least the church in America has today. Um, Bonhoeffer used to call it cheap grace. Right. And, and I think we have a lot of that today that people say a little prayer and, and they don't change. You know, they, they say a little, little quick little prayer, or read a little prayer on a card. In fact, I think Billy Graham would say yeah. at, at his crusades, you know, um, not a lot of people continued on with the Lord. I mean, you can you can play a nice song, you can move them, you can you can I don't want to say manipulate, that's not that's the right word, but I mean you they can they can be moved to, to a point of coming down and saying that prayer or reading that card or whatever, but did it really happen? It really happen. Like John said, there's two sides to the coin. You know, you, you can ask your forgive, forgiveness, but unless there's a change, hmm. um that's the that's the that'd be a transformation in your heart, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was my quote this morning? You uh, you don't change for salvation. You get self you have salvation, and then you want to change. Right? Yes. Right. And that's pretty crude right now. Yeah. No, that's good. I think maybe the second question is, is there sin without the word of God? Another thing. Another well, picture. Hang on one second. One second. This is a good point. Because, okay. So that brings to this question, and, and, and I think this answers that question, is why did God give the law? To show what? Sin. If we didn't have a law, we wouldn't know what was wrong if we had sinned, right? So we have the law, you know, um, the moral law, okay? And so now we know that we do sin, and that should prompt us to something. But um, I have here, repentance is not merely an intellectual change of mind about who Christ is or a superficial remorse over the consequences of sin. It's a radical turning from sin to God. You see, you can, you can be really sorry for your sin. Okay, I was thinking about this just yesterday. My kids, you know, they do something wrong, you know, and you grab them, you know, you know, and they're really repentant, aren't they? I mean, they're really sorrowful, but then you got to think in the back of your mind, are you sorrowful because you just got caught? <laughs> or are you really sorrowful because you recognize the extent of your sin? How sorrowful are you? How, yeah, how, how sorrowful are you? You got something to share. Um, another scripture that I looked at a lot was that Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together, say the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. If they be red like crimson, they should be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you should be the good of the land. But if you refuse to rebel, you should be devoured. And the sword of the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So they understood repentance and mm -hmm. the need for it. Right. You know, they understood what it what coming to Christ would, would mean that, 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 that they would be white as snow. Right. So thinking of that thought, they already have a hope, whether it's just through the word of the Old Testament, through the law, <clears throat> or whether it's through something inside them, there is a hope, there is something that, that's going on. If you will, and talking about sorrow, I listen to what Paul said in Second Corinthians. He says, "I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, right. okay, not that they're just made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. You were <laughs> you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces." a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow the world produces is death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong, in everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. So the sorrowful that comes can lead one or two ways. It can lead to death or it can lead to what? Life. Correct. Like the difference between Judith and, uh, and Peter. You know, both of them 
repented to a degree, but one led to death because he wouldn't <laughs> accept he wouldn't accept the forgiveness that God had for him. And he didn't want to change, but Peter accepted the forgiveness and the change. That's really good. Because you know, Judas did have some remorse at the end, didn't right. he? But it wasn't the remorse or the sorrow that led to repentance. repentance. It led to something else. So then, actions and remorse have nothing to do with salvation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. It has to do with acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord and Messiah. Yeah, the Son of God. Right? Absolutely. Um, Metanoi, that uh -huh. is repentance. Uh, a change of mind, also with a nuance of remorse, as regret for shortcomings and errors in literature, in liter, in, liter, liter, in our, whatever, with focus on the need of change in view of a responsible deity. So that's metanoia, that is the Greek word for, for repentance. Repentance, change of mind, can also refer to regret or remorse accompanying a realization that wrong has been done or to any shift or reversal of thought. In its biblical sense, repentance refers to a deeply seated and thoroughly turning from self to God. It occurs when a radical turning to God takes place in experience in which God is recognized as the most important factor of one's existence. You know, I can remember, um, I can remember, um, and I, I share some of these things with you, but I can remember um, at the beginning of the upper room um, when we were kids, and I can remember hundreds of kids coming to this Bible study and these prayer meetings and things like that. But over time, there were a lot of them that fell out. You know, there, there were a lot of them that weren't there anymore. And I'm just talking to Jim Ramsey the other day because Jim, Jim and I have somewhat a very similar uh, background going to California, you know, when we were younger and, uh, the people that we were there with at school, uh, looking back now, so many of them now aren't with the Lord anymore. You know, and you have to look back and ask yourself, you know, was it just cool to be with the cool kids? You know, um, or did they not have a valid experience? Did they not have a valid? salvation experience did they not really understand repentance and, and forgiveness um but i look back and i don't know if you guys have any of that like if you look back you know even here at the church or in your life you know people that you thought were in they're they're not here anymore you know and paul says something um like you know they were if they were they were of us they would be with us but they're not but they're not they're not here anymore it really wasn't real whatever it is that, that they had so and we I always thought about that sometimes in a situation after the actor takes off all of his costumes and all of his makeup there's the real man yeah yeah okay baptism okay um while there was no baptism of Jews in Judaism, the Jews did baptize Gentile converts to Judaism. Thus, those who were being baptized by John in the Jordan River, as they confessed their sins, were publicly acknowledging that they were no better than the Gentiles. Now, that's, that's pretty serious right there. Um, their sins had separated them from the true and living God cut them off from the covenant blessings for Jewish people to place themselves on the same level as the despised Gentiles were astonishing. It demonstrates the power of John's preaching. But for a few who acknowledged their sin condition and alienation from God and turned into repentance and faith were saved. There's the Greek word for baptism, ceremonial use of water for the purpose of renewing your established relation with God. One who didn't wash a water like baptism. Um, I think um, you could just mention here something about, about baptism here. Um, does baptism save you? No. no. It doesn't, does it? I'm glad, I'm glad you all said that. <laughs> glad you all said that. Now, the baptism here is not Christian baptism, 
okay, because uh, Jesus hadn't come and died yet, so there wasn't the death, burial, and resurrection aspect, right? Um, nor did John's baptism produce forgiveness, for no ritual can accomplish that. So, why baptize? Why was John baptized? Uh, symbolically, is uh, becoming clean and clean in God through you know through the act of you know the washing away of your sin. Okay. But in the Jewish temple, what I would say, they had a pool it's covered over, but they would use that for ceremonial cleaning after you know a, a ritual cleaning. Right. Yeah, and John. That play into he, he was playing off of, of that. Yeah. yeah. yeah what they had back they then with the washing of pots yeah. and the washing of your hands before you ate for the with, for cleanliness, right. which was a law in Deuteronomy. And right. so he just kind of worked off of that. Now you need to be clean. Right. Yeah. Well, outside the temple, there were hundreds of mikvahs. That's the word. Where you uh, before you went into the temple. You right. cleansed yourself. You baptized yourself. Mm -hmm. And so when when the three thousand people on the day of Pentecost get baptized, they're getting baptized in those mikvahs. That's one of the questions. Where would three thousand people get baptized in yeah. Jerusalem? How did that ever happen? Where is the water to make such a thing happen? Well, the whole side of the temple was the ceremonial um, washing area where you would wash before you went into the right. temple. Right. And um, and so that it's actually very common. This picture of baptism and ritual washing and all that was very common to the Jewish community and very much understood what, what, what John was doing. Yeah. So basically, they were acknowledging that what? <coughs> They're dirty. Right. <coughs> They're dirty and they needed, uh, they needed cleansing. And I think we'll stop there. We'll take one minute break, and we'll continue on next week with a professional uh, setting. <laughs> so it's just, we're done. We're done. Yeah. You're not going to listen to me anymore. No, I'll sing my aria. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm, I'm going to think the best.